looks like we're going to have a small group tonight. Um, but uh, I guess we'll um, get started then. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thou hast ascended in glory, O Christ, our God, granting joy to thy disciples by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Through the blessing they were assured that thou art the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Okay. Um, Deacon Alex, can you can you give us our uh, our text, and we will um, see we'll get after it. Um, so, uh, just to give you um, a little bit of a bird's eye, as Cyril is about to do on where we're going. Um, so. He's talked about um, baptism, about chrismation, and about um, the Eucharist contemplated sort of by itself. Um, now he's going to talk about elements of the service uh, that these catechumens were recently first exposed to. Um, so again, you're dealing with uh, a context where you know, all catechumens depart. I mean, I, I don't know necessarily that they said that in the liturgy in that way, but there's something akin to that in the, in the fourth center, century liturgy that, that Cyril is experiencing. Uh, and so the whole back half of the, the liturgy, you know, so from our modern, you know, sort of way of, of reckoning, you know, the cherubic hymn, the entrance with the gifts, um, you know, uh, our experience of the creed, the anaphora, the Our Father, all this kind of thing. All of that is, uh, is new to these people, to these newly illumined people. Um, and so now uh, Cyril is going to give this last lecture, giving some explanation of some of the elements that people have experienced. Um, so... Uh, he begins in this way, uh, quoting First uh, Peter, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and e evil speakings, and so on. On former times of, your meeting, of our meeting together, ye had heard sufficiently by the loving kindness of God concerning baptism and chrism and the partaking of the body and blood of Christ. And now it is necessary to pass on what is next in order meaning today to give the finish to your spiritual edification. You saw then the deacon give to the priest water to wash, and to the presbyters who stood round God's altar. He gave it not at all because of bodily defilement. No, for we did not set out for, for the church with defiled bodies. But this washing of hands is a symbol that ye ought to be pure of all sinful and unlawful deeds. For since the hands are a symbol of action, by washing them, we represent the purity and blamelessness of our conduct. Hast thou not, not heard the blessed David opening this mystery and saying, I will wash my hands in innocency, and so I will compass thine altar, O Lord. The washing, therefore, of hands is a symbol of immunity from sin. Okay, uh, so to make a, a, a few comments on this second section here. Um, the first one is that um, although uh, we do, uh, the, the, the priests wash their hands before the beginning of uh, the, the whole liturgy, right? So we, we actually wash our hands and it's part of the, what we do as preparation. Um, in our present practice at, um, at Holy Trinity, uh, we don't, the priests don't wash their hands. Um, 
however, that is not universally gone in, in, uh, in uh, Orthodox liturgical practice. Um, it's found uh, whenever the bishop serves, for instance, the bishop always at the cherubic hymn, um, he will wash his hands. Uh, it's also something that I experienced in my time in um, rural Alaska, that uh, the Alaskan priests uh, always wash their hands around the point of the cherubic hymn. Uh, so it's interesting, you know, how it can kind of, some elements of the liturgy can kind of sort of drop or reappear and, and in some ways, um, you know, still be with us. As I said, you know, whenever the bishop serves, uh, he will wash his hands uh, at this point. Is that a, is that a Russian and Greek split or no? I don't, well, I mean, it can't be as far as, I, I don't know why, I mean, Deacon Alex, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but I, I don't think any of our OCA service books call for it. But my guess is what happened in Alaska is that the missionaries brought it as a custom and they simply remember it and do it anyway. No, it's not written in their service books either. Either. At least oh, okay. not, their, not their English service books. I mean, I don't, um, obviously I have no idea what's written in their Ubix service books. I wonder, um, what, I wonder what Rocor does formally in their service book. It's difficult to say. I, I, don't, oh. I don't know that one. Deacon, wonder, you're muted. Were you going to say something? Mm -mm. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know formally, uh, and I don't even know what the Greeks do formally in their service books. Um, There's no washing in the, in the Greek book right now. Or is it? Okay. No. Yeah. No, it's just, it, and, and the hierarchical liturgy, remember, is, the, is actually the full liturgy. It's the, everything we do on a Sunday is uh, a lessening of a, you know, it's a step down from, from the full right. celebration of the divine liturgy. So, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and that's it's interesting. Um, you know, in some ways, the hierarchical liturgy. Uh, I mean, there there are patterns in it that are maybe a little bit more innovative, you might say, than than other liturgical practices. But in some ways, it tends to be deeply conservative. And one of them, obviously, is that that the bishop is washing his hands. Um, okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Just, uh, what is the meaning of presbyters in this situation? Presbyter um, in in by by fourth century usage very much means uh, well, at least I think it means. Maybe I don't want to be so strong about it. Presbyter is so presbyter is the Greek word that ends up being mashed up into the English word priest, actually. That's what I thought so, but it it's, says the deacon gives to the priest, and then it mentions the presbyters. Ah, uh, so. uh, now my guess is right there. Um, so the word uh, hieros um, ends up being uh, applied to the clergy. Um, I don't know where it start. I mean, where your first documentation of it is. I believe it's initially first applied to the bishop and then also to the uh to the priests as well um but that's the the sort of old testament word priest it would it would be the analog of the hebrew kohen okay um and my guess is that probably um the deacon is giving the i i can look it up if you'd like to know the proto or the first the first priest you know the yeah you know and then into our service books today, you'll you'll see like the proto deacon or the first deacon gives to the you know, the, the presiding presbyter, um, and this is why in the hierarchical liturgy the priest is going to be the um, the hierarch because the hierarch is going to be serving first. But, but that's probably my guess is it's is it just differentiating between the, the the head celebrant and the all the all the others who are standing <laughs> around the God's altar. So. Um. There's there's a there's such an order and hierarchy and you know and yeah and how people stand one two three four five it's all very ordered so yeah so the word priest there would be it, the, it is here. the celebrant and the yeah. others the presbyters are the lower ones 
So. Yeah, and actually, my guess is, now it's funny, I'm glad you, you picked that out. My suspicion is that if they're observing a Paschal liturgy in um, Jerusalem, he's using the word priest here to mean the bishop. Mm-hmm. Is it would be would be my guess actually that mm-hmm. that that that's the distinction going on. I I wondered a little bit about that, but thank you for and and yes, as I said, that is the word hieros, and the other one is pres presbyteri pr- presbyters. Um. Uh. Okay. So. Um, Right. Uh, so it's interesting. Um, you know, one of the thing, one of the trends, uh, and I probably shouldn't dwell too much more on this particular section, but one of the trends in um, 20th century liturgics was always to look for a functional reason for the things we do liturgically, right? So um, why do we do this? Well, because it serves a purpose. And a lot of things, you know, you really can see a practical purpose. It's interesting that Cyril rejects the notion of a practical purpose for this action. You Mm -hmm. know, I mean, he's basically saying, we washed our hands before we showed up. Um, You know, we would never show up to God's house, you know, with dirty hands and and, and being filthy, you know. Um, So he's saying that this this has a purely symbolic meaning. Um, And... uh, I, I do want to say that the meaning, um, the the last phrase he uses, the sim, a symbol of immunity from sin, that is a a beautiful uh, rendering by by our translator. Um, but having looked the word up, uh, the word immunity, the word that he's translating immunity means um, like kind of no longer being accountable. Like you, you're, 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 it's a, like a symbol that your sins aren't reckoned to you, um, that you're not, uh, not accountable for them anymore. Um, that's assuming that you've, that you've repented, confessed and, and been absolved. Oh, of no? course. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, and it's a symbol as well. I mean, it's like, you know, you do this, but there is such a thing as a wicked, you know, Bishop, I mean, Nestorius uh, served, you know, the the cathedral in Constantinople for a number of years as the bishop, you know, all the while commissioning his priests to write sermons entitled things like "Against the Theotokos." Uh, you know, so um, so there, yeah, there is. I mean, there there is such a thing. Uh, um, so, so it's not it's just, not just having been forgiven. It's the actual act of the liturgy itself. Uh, it, it, it's it's the this is really an this is really an expression of 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 of, of uh, the rejection of of of, of the, donat, the you know donatism. Really, I mean, it, yes. Not sure. I would go there with it. I mean, I think. There's you know, an interesting, like, um, this, the prayer of the washing of the hands is that is, it's a different prayer here than the, what the, the celebrants, when they wash their hands uh, to, to start the service. Uh, this one is connecting specifically with uh, the streams of Jordan River, you know, the Lord our God who has sanctified the streams of Jordan through thy saving epiphany, send down the grace of thy Holy Spirit and bless this water unto the hallowing of all thy people, for blessed art thou unto the ages of ages. Amen. So it's a different prayer than, than what the clergy do when they wash their hands at first. This, is, this seems to be more connecting to the waters of baptism. As, and and, and that, that's know, the bishop's prayer. Yeah. Yeah, that's the bishop's prayer. So it's inter- it's well, that, that's, that's amazing because it keeps, it keeps that, that sacramental unity of the sacraments of initiation together, even in the liturgy. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very tempted to see, um, you know, Christ taking the towel and, you know, asking essentially to, to like, to see an image of, of Christ, um, you know, washing the disciples' feet in this. I mean, there's, there's, there's an echo of baptism, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, very strong. I didn't realize yeah. that was a prayer. That's powerful. I like yeah, that's, it. 
that's really neat. Um, hmm. Okay, shall we move on? Well, let us. Uh, Yes, let us move to uh, so we're go this, th what this means is we're going to have to have a session on uh, or a, a, a class on, on, on liturgy, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's well, a good one, actually. Yeah. I know, I, I would really be very happen. excited. Um, doing a little bit of exegesis of the liturgy is, uh, I mean, that's a very, tell you what, that could be a really useful thing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, I mean, a lot of people, let's be honest, like they kind of come to church and they don't really sort of read the Bible independently, but there are, they, if they're coming to church every Sunday, they are hearing the words of the liturgy, um, you know, and that's, uh, you know, giving them an understanding of what they're doing there. That's a, that's a very important thing. It's a very, very important thing. And I, and I love the, I love the Psalm and in each, each, you know, multiple times over over the last couple of years, when I first when I first really started reading the Psalter and praying through the Psalter, when I when I hit, I will wash my hands in innocency. I, I was lost, and I thought, what in God's name are we doing here? And you know, do I like this or do I not like it? Because at first I didn't understand it, so I pushed it away. And mm. I but it kept coming back at me. It kept coming back at me. And it, this is just one more time of of opening that up. And opening, and it's now become one of my favorite psalms. But hmm. I'm happy to see it here. I've been happy over time to see it here. I like it. Hmm. Anyway, sorry. Okay, no, no problem. Um, <laughs> so I'll I'll read the next section since it's kind of cut on the screen there. Um, the uh, so then the deacon cries aloud, "Receive ye one another, and let us kiss one another." Think not that this kiss ranks with those given in public by common friends. It is not such. This kiss blends souls one with another and solicits for them entire forgiveness. Therefore, this kiss is a sign that our souls are mingled together and have banished all remembrance of wrongs. For this cause, Christ said, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and their remembrance that my, their brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift upon the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. The kiss, therefore, is reconciliation, and for this holy reason, or, and for this reason holy. As the blessed Paul has in his epistles, or epistles urged, greet ye one another with a holy kiss, and Peter with a kiss of charity. Um, so, uh, again, kind of turning to the present, just like we did the last time, uh, here again, we have something that has kind of, um, declined over centuries in practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly the deacon does not say, receive you one another, uh, I would say there, Re receive you one another and let us kiss one another. Um, and now where you see this, uh, but this is practiced, um, in our in our parish life uh so the clergy anyway if they serve with another of equal rank um then they greet and kiss one another um at basically this point of the liturgy mm -hmm. um so um so it, well it's it's um where the deacon says let us love one another that with one mind we may confess, we confess. and we we move to the creed right mm -hmm. and at that point if there are you know, two priests can celebrating, then they, the one will walk around the altar and they, they both uh, bow and kiss the altar. And then they go over to one another and they greet one another with the kiss of peace. Um, so uh, I would say, um, regarding that, you know, uh, I think maybe without belaboring the point too far um this is really very much a physical expression of like okay if you're going to be a communicant in christ then you need to be at peace with your neighbor and part of what that means is forgiveness you know i mean it's, he uses the word reconciliation um you know but ideally uh and mary i mean you kind of brought up the different you know how the symbol that we use with the water might be different than the reality. 
you know? And so there is, of course, the possibility that somebody gives somebody else a Judas kiss at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, but obviously what we're trying to do is, you know, teach people to forgive one another. And it's nice in the church that, um, that this is still preserved for us with all the laity kissing one another uh, on Forgiveness Sunday. Yes. You know, that this is, uh, now some of, uh, I, I think, and Deacon Alex, you might be able to correct me if I'm mistaken on this. I think that the kiss of peace basically dropped entirely out of Orthodox liturgies. It has been revived by some groups. I think there are a lot of Antiochian churches that practice the kiss of peace. Is that kind of your understanding, Deacon Alex? Yeah, yes, that is correct. And it, and that, it, and it, it some of the criticism is that they're not practicing as it as it used to be practiced. It was very orderly, um, as mm. as Father mentioned, priests with priests, deacons with deacons, men with men, women with women. It's not mm. a mm -hmm. free for all kiss fest. It's really it's really meant oh. to be orderly, um, and you know, and you know, in in sections, and, and you know, it's 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 a very liturgical looking yes, action. It should be ritualized. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so so it's it's so yeah so it. But, but yeah, you'll be, you, there's some churches, especially with members of the uh, kind of Antiochian, like the former evangelicals that came into orthodoxy with like the Peter, Father Peter Gilchrist's group, they, they'll, they, they do that in their, their liturgy. So. Um, you know, actually, I, I will say another, another place uh, in the Buskiak, the Paschal liturgy probably takes like five hours. And part of it is that in their local custom, everybody kisses everybody else before it's over. Uh, and the village is about 400 strong. In, so, in every liturgy? No, no, just in Pasca. Oh, I, so, okay. So, I mean, although locally up there, because it is a whole village and they don't have any kind of building that could possibly fit this, they don't eat together at the end. Um, but the liturgy itself, I mean, yeah, I think... It was done at like 4.30, maybe. Wow. It was long. Uh, but, but part of it was the longness of kind of a reenactment of forgiveness vespers, mm -hmm. uh, except this time without bowing, you know, uh, and this time with greeting everyone with Christ is risen. Um, but then again, in the local piety in that area, um, forgiveness vespers, I was telling Deacon Alex, forgiveness vespers is probably after Pascha the best attended service of the church year. Uh, it's interesting the different things that different parishes will focus focus on. Okay. That makes sense too, Father, because you have like you have the Paschal Estakira, you know, let us embrace each other, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. us call brothers, mm -hmm. even those that hate us. So, so yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking of that. Yeah, God, I missed that this year. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, mm. Sorry, Mary. No, it's all right. Um, so it'll be even better next year. Yep, absolutely. God, God willing. God willing. Okay. Um, somebody else want to read the, uh, the fourth section then? I will. Okay. After this, the priest cries aloud, lift up your hearts. For truly ought we in that most awful hour to have our heart on high with God and not below, thinking of earth and earthly things. The priest then, in effect, bids all in that hour abandon all worldly thoughts or household cares and to have their heart in heaven with the merciful God. Then ye answer, we lift them up unto the Lord, assenting to him by your avowal. But let no one come here who with his lips can say, we lift up our hearts to the Lord, but in mind employs his thoughts on worldly business. God indeed should be in our memory at all times, but if this is impossible by reason of human infirmity, at least in that hour, this should be our earnest endeavor. Amen. Um, I would note, uh, you know, there's kind of a major element that uh, of, of our experience of liturgy that's missing here. Uh, and that would be, um, so between the kiss of peace and the, uh, the beginning of the anaphora, which is what we're about, we're starting here with, with, with these words, mm -hmm. um, there is no creed. Um, and in fact, uh, the creed will not be, uh, added to the liturgy broadly for another 150 years. 
Um, and in fact, the creed that gets added to the liturgy isn't even written yet um, mm -hmm. because it'll be written in 381. <laughs> um, but uh, um, so, so there's a direct movement from the, the piece. Uh, although I should say, you know, it's hard to know. He's not like giving us necessarily an exhaustive play-by-play -play either. I mean, it's, it's hard to know what mm -hmm. elements he might be omitting or, or kind of moving past or whatever. Um, but uh, no, it was the emperor Anastasios around the year 500 that, uh, that asked the bishops to insert the creed into all the liturgies, and that's, and that's when it was done. I'm going to make a quick confession. That insertion of the creed in the liturgy at that point is so, to me, has, has always been disruptive. And <laughs> at, some, at some level, I turn it off because it, it interrupts the flow that this represents here. And I don't like it. And I, I tend to recite the creed, uh, but, but me, there's a part of me that's elsewhere waiting to hmm. carry on with the liturgy it's it's a very it's all and it's always been that way and i don't talk about it because it, it just sounds so awful but i don't like the creed there huh never well, it's interesting and okay. it's interesting i think mary i think one of the reasons why is because it's the one of the, it's only one of the few times if any even besides the uh the that prayer the pre-communion prayer uh, where we use the word I, you know, where we, everything else is let us right. and our, mm -hmm. this, it's, it's, it is a jarring change. It, is. Of, it, it, it really is jarring. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting though. I, I will say, you know, one thing I like about it is that it really highlights the fact that our Eucharist is, is united around a common confession of faith. I mean, and that's that's always one of the the the, the difficulties that people have had, you know, because it's like at a certain point, like you've got your Arius running around and he's saying Jesus, 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 but he's not meaning what we mean. What, what someone and, else? And he think. can't possibly think he's eating. You know, he can't think he's partaking of the body and and blood. Uh, well, you know, to use um, St. Peter's words. Uh, you you killed the author of life. You know he he can't think that he's partaking of 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 the body and blood of the author of life in the same way that we do. So I mean I, I you know I don't know that that kind of thing in the liturgy. Uh, I I I like it. I mean I'm just you know. Uh, <laughs> but no, I uh, I wouldn't mind if we did it first. I, I mean I yeah. think if it came first. Um, that might that might help, but I, but but where where it was eventually put, I I find it disruptive, and 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 I live with it. The and other uh, the other early really uh, complain. Early middle sixth century liturgical insertion that's very like dogmatic in that way, is um is the emperor Justinian's um only begotten son and immortal word of God. God. Yeah. Um. So that I mean, which also I love. Um, yeah, I mean, not that one. I don't mind at all. Um, but it, I mean, but on the other hand, it's also in a less less important place in the grand scheme of the liturgy. I mean, the, you know, second antiphon is not like, yeah, we're not we're not doing a consecration here, you know. No. no. So. No, and I suppose that's why that the 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 that declaration of faith and belief at that moment, it, that's why it's there, I, I, I expect, because that's the... Yeah, you, you almost have to wonder if, um, I mean, that, that let us love one another that with one mind we may confess, you know, is that like a direct substitution? I mean, does that end up, you know, sort of being, because, I mean, it, liturgically, the thing that happens after that is said is the same thing that happens after receive you one another and let us kiss one another, right? I mean, the, the kiss of peace takes place at that point. Yes. So, but, but it's interesting, it's interesting, you know, that there's that like, okay, you know, we're kissing one another in peace, but it has to be in the unity of faith as well. Whoa, Deacon Mark. Hello, sorry. Oh, there he is. Oh. Communication problems here, sorry. No problem. 
welcome aboard. Thank you. Um, so we're we're in the middle of uh, of um, talking about the uh, the hidden part of the liturgy, the part of the liturgy that these catechumens who are now now they're not catechumens anymore; they're newly illumined. But this is the stuff that they've just experienced for the first time. Um, Wonderful. So Cyril is is kind of explaining this to them. Okay. So, so let's uh, let's move on there to, um, to section five. Um, we've just started the anaphora. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll read it. Then the priest says, "Let us give thanks to the Lord, for in good sooth are we bound to give thanks that He has called us unworthy as we are to so great grace." that he has reconciled us who were his foes, that he hath vouchsafed to us the spirit of adoption. Then ye say, it is meet and right. For in giving thanks, we do a meet thing and a right. But he did not a right thing, but what was more than right, he did us good and counted us meet for such great benefits. Boy, there's a lot of meat in that mm -hmm. section. <laughs> Um, do you guys know what, what, how, somebody give me a definition of the word meat, M-E-E-T. Um, since we also use this in our, our OCA translation of, of the liturgy today. Well, I will say it means good, but you had said something a couple sessions ago that the, it was a, it's a word that has an interesting interpretation. Yeah, well, the, the, yeah, good is, you know, I, I suppose so. I mean, um, I think it's more, more directly like fitting or appropriate or correct. I just, yeah, I was just going to say appropriate to the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but good, good is, a, I think, you know, in, in used in that sense, I think good is a, is a decent uh, rendering of it. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I also had to look up the expression in good sooth because <laughs> that one was a little beyond me. Um, it means uh, in, in truth or in reality. So, um, so he says, in reality, we are bound to give thanks. Um, and why are we, we, we are bound, we're well, almost like compelled um, to give thanks. Uh, because he has called us unworthy as we are to so great grace. Um, so he's done these incredible things for us. You know, he's reconciled us even though we were his enemies. Um, he's given us the Holy Spirit. Um, and for this reason, you know, we're, we're bound to give thanks. Um, And when we give thanks, he says, uh, we do something that is meet, that's appropriate and right. Um, but Christ, on the other hand, he didn't do something that was just right or correct. Um, but he did us something that was just good. And he counted us fitted meat, appropriate for such, such great benefits. Um, by the way, this... Um, you know, as I've said, we, we use uh, many words for Holy Communion, one of them being uh, Eucharist. Uh, and Eucharist means Thanksgiving, right, fundamentally. Um, and so that expression, let us give thanks unto the Lord. I don't have Greek in front of me, but it's probably evharistomen. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's let us Eucharist. I said, no. No, that, that, that's like, uh, yes, but what I said was correct. The Greek word I said was definitely just wrong. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I, I conjugated it wrong and I can't remember how to conjugate it rightly. Um, okay, any questions on that or shall we move along? I can go forward. Okay, all right. You read number six for us then? After this, we make mention of heaven and earth and sea of the sun and moon of the star, oh, 
of the sun and moon of the stars. Uh, there's no way to get that any bigger for this blind woman, huh? For the sun, for the sun and the moon and the stars and all creation, rational and irrational, visible and invisible, of angels, archangels, virtues, dominions, principalities, powers, thrones, of the terabim with many faces, in effect, repeating that call of David's, magnify the Lord with me. God, that line almost always makes me cry. Oh. We make mention also of the seraphim, whom he says by the, by the Holy Ghost beheld, earthly th beheld, what did he behold? Where are we? Beheld encircling he's on the next page oh, encircling the throne of god with two of their wings veiling their countenance and with two their feet and with two flying who cried holy 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 lord god of sabaoth for this cause rehearse we this confession of god delivered down to us from the seraphim that we may join in hymns with the hosts of the world above wow. very good and this is um you know, uh, obviously at Holy Trinity, um, these prayers are all done out loud. Mm. Um, but, you know, largely they are, I mean, whether we're doing the St. Basil liturgy or the St. John Chrysostom liturgy, there's a, there's a general following of, of this ordering that, uh, uh, wait a minute, what have I done? Yeah, well, there's a general following of this ordering, you know, so, so, um, and, and you end up getting to um, the priest say, you know, invoking the seraphim and their hymn. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, we, I mean, the choir will sing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see here. Any, any questions on that section then? Mm -mm. No, and I love it when it goes on to holy art thou and all holy. That that just is, yeah, that one, I always want to lie down on my face. <laughs> I, always, well. I always want to prostrate at that moment, holy art thou and all holy. Hmm. Mary, you say that, and, and when I grew up, that's, we were kneeling at that point. It might be really? my parents, yeah. We were yeah. actually about that, that. That's, it cry, it calls out for it, it cries out for it that action it cries out for us to, to act at that moment but for some reason it always does for me but then i'd look silly so i don't i i can't be an orthodox priest without slipping this in um you know the church sees the three holies uh that that i the, the seraphim isaiah are singing as a reference to the holy trinity okay like i said i can't be an orthodox priest without slipping that in right <laughs> um, Hmm. So, um, it's not it's not accidental that there are there are three that they're singing holy to, or three three holies that they're singing rather. Mm -hmm. um, Father, what were the three? The well, three holies, holy, holy, oh, holy. Oh yeah, so it's the the um so the the fathers will see uh, generally the the song of the seraphim here that that comes out of the book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. um, this holy, holy, holy as, as a um, prophecy of slash reflection of the reality of the Trinity. Um, so, and this gets expanded in our liturgics, right? So the, the hymn that we sing, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us, which is also Trinitarian, right? Um, but that is an expansion of the song of the seraphim. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I, I'm going to be, uh, I'll take number seven here. Um, then having sanctified ourselves by these spiritual hymns, we call upon the merciful God to send forth his Holy Spirit upon the gifts lying before him, that he would make the bread the body of Christ and the wine the blood of Christ. For whatsoever the Holy Ghost has touched is sanctified and changed. Um, sanctified being made holy. Um, so again, you know, it's, uh, and the, the John Chrysostom liturgy um, is much more explicit in this with the making the change by the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the Basil liturgy, um, 
goodness. Deacons, help me. <laughs> what is, the basil doesn't actually use that. What's the, what's the, okay, there we go. <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> um, Uh, yeah. All right. It's um so it's uh the 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 prayer in the basal liturgy is um um yeah, I'll start at the most convenient point in the sentence anyway. O holy of holies, that by the favor of thy goodness thy holy spirit may come upon us and upon these gifts now offered and bless them. Uh, to bless them and to hallow and to show this bread to be truly the precious body of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, and that which is in that, and this cup to be truly the precious blood of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for the life of the world. So it's uh, you don't have that very explicit. Yeah. So he's ah. got the chrysostom. Um, he's got the chrysostom up there. Yes, I, I see the difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Father Deacon. We'll move to the next uh, move to the next uh, section there. But that's um, yeah. So this, but the theology is consistent, right? I mean, uh, obviously, since Saint Basil is you know living and doing his work at the time of uh, of Saint Cyril. And St. John Chrysostom is probably not born yet. Um, you know, neither of the anaphoras that we use are identical to what Cyril is using. Um, but yet you can see the consistency, not only in the form, but also in the theology. You know, this, that, that, that this, we're invoking the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming upon the bread and the wine, and he's transforming them uh, into the body and blood of Christ. Um, so there is a consistency there. In with the with no, in 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 my travels, and I can't remember precisely who, which ones they are, but in in some of the liturgical histories that I have read over time, mm -hmm. the epiclesis, the the language of the epiclesis, it is said was at one time in the bidding prayers, and the bidding prayers were those prayers that were prayed when the gifts were brought to the church mm -hmm. it, so it would have been at the at the back of the church in the in the narthex i guess where they brought the mm. brought the gifts in but 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 that that the that the calling down of the holy spirit on the gifts initially were the bidding prayers that that were mm. in the beginning and not at the actual consecration is there but I can't remember yeah. re ever reading a history that said, you know, the epiclesis was was inserted here at this time. So I really don't I don't have that piece of it. Well, I'm 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 certainly not an expert on the history of liturgics. Um, you know, yeah. I think just to some degree, the you know the place that we do things in um, is not necessarily critical and at one time in the orthodox church i mean right now we live in a time when the orthodox church is um you know pretty like very in the grand scheme very ritually you know standardized if you will mm -hmm. um you know but back in history there was a time when there were other um rites that were distinct from the ones that we use Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is, you know, the question is, um, are we sharing the same faith and are we essentially doing the same thing? You know, um, it's not like ordering and actually it, good that you, uh, you bring that up now because I'm about to mention some ordering uh, again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ordering of things can potentially vary over time. Um, you know, and that's not necessarily wrong. Um, 
but again, I don't know what, and, and the other, the other thing too is one thing I'm a little suspicious of in terms of like liturgical archeology span and trying to sort of reconstruct ancient rites mm -hmm. is, are we sure these are rites in use by Orthodox Christians? You know, you know, are, are you sure that that scroll that you got wasn't written by Arians or something like that? Um, I mean, again, I, I'm not an expert on those things, but it's just something that needs to be considered. Mm -hmm. In the, um, yeah. Yeah. That the because, scholars and because, because faith, I mean, faith does inform practice and you want to say mm -hmm. like, like, like Christians, for instance, like you want to say, well, you know, Christians in the, in the, in the fifth century practiced, you know, multiple types of baptism and this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, there were heretical groups that, that deliberately immersed once because they, they did that to deny the divinity of, of Christ and of the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the church rejected their baptism. Um, so, you know, if you were to come and find the sort of uh, the writings of those people and find their texts, you can say there are these divergent Christian groups that do different things. But for us as Orthodox, we would say, well, their, their practice is wrong. It's based in a, it's based in a heretical theology. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, without knowing specifically what texts and, and having any background in it, whatever, I can't really comment on, on what you've encountered mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. but, no, um, I'm just, and I'm not, a, I'm not, I mean, I, I, there is, there's a certain standardization and, and a stability that you have to have, but I tend, I tend not to be a terrible rigorist in terms of, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. That doesn't make me sound like it, like it's like I'm loose with it. I'm not. I just, yeah. I just don't, I, I just don't get all weighed out over certain things. And certainly I would prefer to see what the ancients did than to just assume that, that, that some change is somehow a, a deviation from that anyway yeah yeah i mean yeah that's that, that that's uh you know and again as i said there there was a time um when the orthodox church had a number of of rights you know i mean our right now our you know our liturgy is basically i mean it's the descendant of um this sort of Jerusalem Constantinople axis, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yes, but that doesn't mean that, like, if you had gone into the West in the sixth century and encountered something, you know, fairly different, you would have that it would have been, you know, Somewhere. wicked and evil, and uh, but you wouldn't have encountered uh, unleavened bread yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Uh, not you at wouldn't. that point. A couple centuries later, yes, but. Um, okay, uh, so section eight there. I can read that. Thank you. Then after the spiritual sacrifice is perfected, the bloodless service upon the sacrifice of propitiation, we entreat God for the common peace of the church, for the tranquility of the world, for kings, for soldiers and allies, for the sick, for the afflicted, and in a word, for all who stand in need of succor, we all supplicate and offer the sacrifice. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it's interesting. Um, so uh, the word translated perfected there might be better brought into modern English with the word completed. Um, mm -hmm. After the spiritual sacrifice is, is completed. Um, the bloodless uh, latria, the bloodless worship. Um, and uh, I, I assume grammatically here that our, our guy is a little bit, um, I'm, I'm not sure I like his use of commas or lack of use thereof. Um, so I, I think that the upon that sacrifice of propitiation, which means um, like appeasement, that, that sacrifice of, of, of conciliation, um, then upon that, we entreat God for the common peace of the church, for the tranquility of the world, et cetera. Um, you know, it's interesting thinking about 
Cyril praying for kings, um, because he almost certainly, when he writes this theologically, he's an opponent of the king that is in power where he is. Um, and most of the kings that he's aware of in the world are pagans. Um, it's just very interesting, you know, this... Um, what we're doing in the liturgy is not just for ourselves, uh, I think is what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here. Um, oh, uh, Diognetus in the second century uh, says that uh, as the soul is in the body, so are Christians in the world. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's interesting, you know, that, that, in doing our our central act of worship, we're not just looking at ourselves, but we're looking outward, actually. Um, and this is something that is still, um, you know, practiced in our prayers, although it's, uh, and Mary, this is to come back to your point earlier, it's reversed in order. Uh, th this thing is done after the next part. Um, yes, for the sick, the suffering, the captives, and their salvation, and then... Yes. Um, yes. Um, so, um, all right. Uh, any other questions on that section there? Or, I have a question, or, Father, but it's kind of interesting. It's sort of that, that, that section eight is, in a sense, like the great litany. Let's, let's count everybody. Let's put everybody into this that we're praying for. Right. Yeah, I almost feel like I should like be reading these prayers side by side. You know, like with, it, with yeah, this. it'd be interesting. Um, um, we can do but, that when we do the liturgical thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, who would like, uh, Deacon Mark, you want to take that section nine for us? Sure. Then we commemorate also those who have fallen asleep before us. First, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, that at their prayers and intervention, God would receive our petition. Afterwards, also on behalf of the Holy Fathers and bishops who have fallen asleep before us, and in a word, of all who in past years have fallen asleep among us, believing that it will be a very great advantage to the souls for whom the supplication is put up. While well, that holy and most awful sacrifice is presented. Most awful? How can you say that, Deacon Mark? Yeah, and it's, you know, it's a crazy word that you read about that's most awful. It's like a, a, a um, backwards um, exaltation. Full, yeah, full of all. all yeah, it's a, full it's of a, all. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, actually, it's probably much more akin to the lofty modern use of the word awesome right, right. Mm. you know as long as you're not using it like a teenager um <laughs> then although we do refer to god as terrible at, on occasion right but again there's i mean there you're, you're you're like like with this use of awful you're dipping into archaic usage i mm -hmm. mean you know because nobody like uh no nobody would say um you know, uh, boy, I'm going to get myself burned alive for this, but, but <laughs> President Trump is a most awful president. <laughs> and nobody, nobody would mean, you know, like um, he inspires awe or, or, or you know, potentially yeah, that he's like sublime and, 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 and potentially even scary. But like, you know, they, they, they would just mean that he's, terrible in the, yeah, it was awful the way that we all mean awful um you know um but uh anyway yeah so this uh again this is this is stuff uh that happens immediately and you know when when the priest um uh when the priest has uh said the prayers of the anaphora um, then he'll, you know, s stand up and, or 
arise and say, you know, again, we offer unto thee this rational worship for those who have fallen asleep in the faith, ancestors, fathers, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, ascetics, and every righteous spirit made perfect in faith, especially for... Oh, the Holy Virgin Mary. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, obviously goes on uh, and, 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 and follows this pattern. Oh, hey, he's, he's got it right up there. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it, it, it follows, um, you know, it, it follows this pattern, uh, except it's in, it's in reverse order. As I said, the, the prayers for the living then come after this. Um, you know, we start, uh, and that kind of reaches a climax with the prayer for the bishop, although it's not over at that point. Uh, I have a question on, well, could we go back to the other one? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, well, I, uh, theologically, I don't understand prayers for the dead. I kind of never got to that part. I mean, it just never worked. I, yeah. So I don't really completely get that, but it is so what are we su uh, supplicating for them then uh didn't they that word yeah in the last part of nine yeah uh for whom supplication is put up so uh and great advantage to the soul so how how what does that mean um i, I think the i the idea is that basically like i mean this is kind of like the most holy moment of regular church life um and we're at that moment we're you know basically asking god to forgive and give eternal life to these people um uh, maybe i'm not answering your question um, no that I, yeah okay that's but that, that's sort of done in an ongoing way i mean even if they've been dead for a long time sure um you know Actually, and, I, and it might be good and good to remind it, that the liturgy itself is a punctuation of earth and heaven. So we are joining really the uh, uh, these four fathers uh, in prayer. They're 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 mm -hmm. they're there with us, um, together with us. So the distinctions between living and dead really are blur blurred at this point because we're we're joining in progress a heavenly heavenly liturgy that's already taking place. Uh, so but that mm -hmm. forgive my interruption no, that's a, a fascinating concept to me but i have no experiential sense of it at all so <laughs> i will just keep an open mind yeah <laughs> well, um, you know i always it's interesting because i always think about when the transfiguration took place and there was you know peter james and john sitting on earth and then christ was raised up with moses and elijah and they were all speaking with each other and so they were all alive not in different forms but they were all alive mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, it's you know this part of when we commemorate all these patriarchs and apostles and so forth i, I just remember a priest told me one time you know praying for someone who is all the time you know healthy and then maybe sick and then passes away and it was the most um wonderful thought that commemorating them in the in the uh, preparation for the liturgy was just moving a, a particle of the host from one side of the of the path in there or the or the uh, you know the disc discos from one side to the other and it was just all of a sudden yeah we're all together we're just on a different side of the fence right now hmm. um. I'm, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my childhood with this one because it's important, I think. And it, 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 I'm, I'm going to do something that I would have done or say something that I would learned as a, as a young Catholic youth, as a child, really, mm -hmm. five, six years old. And, and it, 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 it was the, the, the sisters would say to us, and it always captured me 
they would say to us when when we are in the mass and when father is consecrating and we are you know we are participating with him in eucharist in that thanksgiving that that the, the the that the powers and principalities of heaven that the that the that the that the angels all of them would would come down and the saints and they would surround us and they would surround the altar and they would lift up their voices in song with us and that that even if we couldn't see them and couldn't hear them they were there and that if you open your heart to them you'll know that they are there and i've always had that sense of that during this part of the liturgy during the anaphora that they are that we are all there that heaven you know that that the line between heaven and earth has been has been breached and it's it's all together and it's 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 an amazing thing but as as you said and as i understand it has it's something i i grew with from the time i was little <laughs> till now and so for me it's automatic for you it, it would be odd you know, I, I I'm trying to imagine what what that would be like had I not been taught that as a as a as a baby. That's an interesting difference in perception, and I I, I agree with you actually, Mary, from my own experience that, um, I won't say praying for the dead was like a major stumbling block for me coming into the church, but it was definitely something different. Yeah. different yeah like that was not our piety mm -hmm. uh, in fact when somebody died it was always we will pray for you family members who are still here i mean that's right. that's like almost exactly how we would express ourselves um but you didn't you didn't pray for the person who had departed um so uh no and anyway, it wasn't if always you want to discuss I mean, that with me uh and some of the the uh kind of scriptural things going on with that uh potentially in the future we can we can do that um okay. although at this point uh probably we should uh, keep moving because oh, we've yeah. got lots and lots of uh, pages ahead of us um so uh and i'll 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 follow cyril here i wish to, pers to persuade you by an illustration for i know that many say what is the soul profited which departs from this world either with sins or without sins, if it be commemorated in the prayer. Now surely if when a king had banished certain who had given him offense, their connections should weave a crown and offer it to him on behalf of those under his vengeance, would he not grant a respite to their punishments? In the same way we, when we offer to him our supplications for those who have fallen asleep, though they be sinners, weave no crown, but offer up Christ, sacrificed for our sins, propitiating our merciful God, both for them and for ourselves. Um, wow. I'll leave that to you guys. Wow, really? I'll leave that to you guys. I'm taking the easy way out this time. Thanks. And now, surely, if if when a king had banished certain who had given him offense, their connections are there. Is is that those who those family who, members? Their family, yes. Their friends, those family their friends. Yeah, should weave a crown and offer it to him on behalf of those under his vengeance. Would he then not grant a respite to their punishments? Well. <laughs> I know where that takes me. I'm not sure where it takes everybody else. You know, um, that, that idea, that idea certainly is, um, uh, yeah, the, the idea that, um, we can positively affect those who have departed by prayer something i mean actually i guess i'm kind of going to go there a little bit now i mean it, it's it's in judaism before christianity right i mean you have jews that yeah. don't believe in the resurrection you have jews that do believe in the resurrection 
Um, and you can see, I believe it's in Second Maccabees, where um, you've got uh, some of uh, the the Jewish soldiers who are rebelling against the Seleucids. They die in battle, and it turns out they've got like idol medallions and this sort of thing on their persons. And um, I think it's Judas Maccabeus sends back to the temple and says, look, you know, let's have a sacrifice made on behalf of these people so that, you know, even though they practice this idolatry, that maybe God will forgive them um, and grant them the resurrection. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is an old idea. Um, it's interesting, though. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, deacons especially, I, I don't even fully know how to take, you know, this sense of us offering up Christ, sacrificed for our sins. Both for them and for ourselves. Yeah, I, that, that's, as I came along, you, you, didn't, you didn't just pray for the dead alone. When you prayed for the dead, you were praying more all those dead in sin you were you were praying for all of those including yourself who in some way were however small or however large were trapped in sin because when trapped in sin we are not free and so it's 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 an an appeal to god to propitiate or free us uh, from from those sins and if you fall asleep, and it's not, so when I say sins, I don't just mean offenses that cut us off from God. I mean anything that keeps us from being, from participating, from being able to participate with God mm -hmm. and participate in, in his divine life. So it's, it's not just that, that sin which cuts us off and makes us, makes us incapable of communicating with him at all, but but that that those those small things and those those habits and it, it it's like the holy fathers that, that talk about you know the, about stilling the passions and about you know cutting all ties to the world because with, when there's even the slightest bit of of, of attachment uh, we we have it it, it keeps us from participating fully in the way that God wants us to participate with him. And so that's what those prayers are all about. Not so much. And, and there's another, uh, there's another aspect of it, which is the body and the soul. And, and once the human, once the human body and soul are separated in death, the soul doesn't die, but the body, the body goes and corrupts. And so you cannot act morally without the soul and the body being together because the soul and the spirit cannot act in the same way that the soul does. So once the spirit has crossed over into the next life, then it's incumbent upon us who are still in our bodies and who can still act morally to, to do so on their behalf. And that's, that's another aspect of it that I find compelling. Hmm. Well, um, I think probably I, I'm, I'm realizing that uh, we, we probably need to pick up the pace here uh, a bit. Uh, no, no, don't don't worry about it, Mary. I, I just um, I'm thinking, you know, we, we have quite a bit of ground to cover in this particular um, lecture. Uh, Cyril apparently, you know, he has one last shot at these people, and he wants to <laughs> make it a long one anyway. <laughs> no, no, I'll be quiet. Um, no, don't 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 worry about. It. I mean, I I just. Uh, but, but let's uh, move, I think, a little bit faster here. And I'll, I'll read um, 11 and 12 then. Then after these things, we say that prayer which the Savior delivered to his own disciples with a pure conscience, styling God our Father and saying, Our Father which art in heaven, O most surpassing loving kindness of God, on them who revolted from him and were in the very extreme of misery has he bestowed such complete forgiveness of their evil deeds and so great participation of grace that they should even call him father, our father, which art in heaven. They also too are a heaven, which bear the image of the heavenly in whom God is dwelling and walking in them. Hallowed be thy name. 
The name of God is in its own nature holy, whether we say so or not. But since it is sometimes profaned among sinners, according to the words, though through you my name is continually blasphemed among the Gentiles, we pray that in us God's name may be hallowed. Not that it becomes holy from not being holy, but because it becomes holy in us when we become holy and do things worthy of holiness. Somebody want uh, thy kingdom come and thy will be done? Thy kingdom come. The clean soul can say with boldness, thy kingdom come. For he has heard Paul saying, let not sin reign in your mortal body, but has cleansed himself in deed, thought, and word. Will say to God, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. The divine and blessed angels do the will of God, as David in, the, in a psalm has said, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments. So then thou meanest by thy prayer, as thy will be done, as thy will is done by the angels, so be it done on earth also by me, Lord. So we're, we are going to continue moving fast but please um you know stop us anybody if uh, if there's something that you know you want to comment on so give us this day our super substantial bread this common bread is not super substantial bread but this holy bread is super substantial that is appointed for the substance of the soul for this bread goeth not into the belly and is cast out into the draft but is diffused through all thou art for the benefit of soul of body and soul but by this day he means each day as also paul has said while it is called today and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors for we had many sins and we offend both in word and in thought, and very many things do we worthy of condemnation. And if we say we have no sin, we lie, as John says. And we enter into a covenant with God, entreating him to pardon our sins, as we also forgive our neighbors their debts. Considering then what we receive and for what, let us not put off nor delay to forgive one another. The offenses committed against us are slight and trivial and easily settled, but those we have committed against God are great and call for mercy such as is his only. Take heed, therefore, lest for these small and inconsiderable sins against thyself, thou bar against thyself forgiveness from God for thy most grievous sins. Can I have another reader for, and lead us not into temptation. I can do that. Um, and lead us not into temptation, O Lord. Does then the Lord teach to pray thus, these that we may not be tempted at all? And how is it said elsewhere, the man who is not tempted is unproved? And again, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Or rather, does not the en entering into temptation mean that being whelmed under the temptation? For the temptation is like a winter torrent, difficult to cross. Some then, being most skillful swimmers, pass over, not being whelmed beneath temptations, nor swept down by them at all, while others who are not such, entering into them, sink in them. As, for example, Judas entering into the temptation of covetous, uh, covetousness. <laughs> <laughs> swam not through it, but sinking beneath it, was choked both in body and spirit. Peter entered into the temptation of the denial, and having entered it, he was not overwhelmed by it, but manfully swimming through it, he was delivered from the temptation. Listen again in another place to the company of unscathed saints, giving thanks for deliverance from temptation. For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us like as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest 
us out into a wealthy place. Thou seest them speaking boldly because they passed through and were not pierced, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. Now they're coming into a wealthy place. Is they're being delivered from temptation? Okay, thank you. And uh, will uh, somebody take us for eighteen? Okay. But deliver us from the evil. If lead us not into temptation, had implied the not being tempted at all, he would not have said but deliver us from the evil. Now the evil is the wicked spirit who is our adversary for whom we pray, from whom we pray to be delivered. Then after completing the prayer, thou sayest amen. By this amen, which means so be it, setting thy seal to the petitions of this divinely taught prayer. Can I read uh, 19? Can I do 19? <laughs> Okay. After this, the priest says holy things to holy men. Holy are the gifts presented since they have been visited by the Holy Ghost. Holy are you also having been vouchsafed the Holy Ghost. The holy things therefore correspond to the holy persons. Then ye say, one is holy, one is the Lord Jesus Christ, for truly one is holy by nature, holy. We too are holy but not by nature, only by participation and discipline and prayer. Bingo. <laughs> that's, um, you know, that's why I often say to people, um, when you look at the icons, all of the halos are Christ's halo. Like they're not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, uh, you know, he's, he is, and, and it's funny, you know, it's as the priest announces the holy things for the holy people, you know, for, for the holy ones, for the saints. Um, then at that people, at that point, there's almost like a, a rebuttal um, from the congregation, you know, no, not us. <laughs> One is holy. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, so are we, because we're participating in that one. Um, you know, one is holy, by nature holy. And then as Cyril says, but we too are holy, not by nature, but by participation and discipline and prayer. Um, any other comments on, on that section? I wonder if by discipline there, he means obedience. I, I really don't know, actually. And while well, I'm kind of tempted to see what Greek word there is there, probably uh, it's best for us to continue to move. Okay. Um, so, um, all right. So I'll, I'll take 20. And after this, you hear the chanter with a sacred melody inviting you to the communion of the holy mysteries and saying, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Trust not the decision to thy bodily palate. No, but with faith unfaltering, uh, for when we taste, uh, when we taste, we are, we are bidden to taste not bread and wine, but the sign of the body and blood of Christ. Um, is that the end of twenty there? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I got Deacon Alex. I got stuck in Deacon Alex's head. Um, so at, at regular liturgies, you know, um, the communion hymn is not O Taste and See, but um, in the pre-sanctified liturgies, mm -hmm. um, O Taste and See, um, you know, that, that, that is uh, actually very neat. You know, here we are still 16 centuries later, still using that at some liturgies as um, as uh, you know, the the communion hymn. Um, so Cyril once again turns to one of the major themes of his last lecture, saying, "You know, yes, what you're what you're consuming, what you're taking into yourself, it tastes like bread and wine. But remember, this is not just bread and wine. It's uh, 
what our translator here translates as the sign of the body and blood of Christ, but the word is antitype. You remember we talked about that before as um, as this sort of earthly um, manifestation or working out of a heavenly reality. You know, it's like that that image of the 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 mold you know, kind of being pressed on something. And then there's like an earthly correspondence to something that, that is heavenly. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on there. Um, any other questions on that section? Yes. One, can we yes. sometime, come sometime do some sort of discussion of real presence when there's more time? Um, <laughs> that's yeah. that. Is the answer, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, we are uh, we're definitely in in need of a bit of time here. So, but yeah. don't worry, I'll have plenty of fodder for discussion in the next couple sections. Okay. So, who would like? Who would be so brave as to to take twenty one for us? Approaching, therefore, come not with thy wrist extended or thy fingers open, but make thy left hand as if a throne for the rock for thy right which is on the eve of receiving the king and having hallowed the palm receive the body of christ saying after it amen then after thou hast with carefulness hallowed thine eyes by the touch of thy holy bread partake thereof giving heed lest thou lose any of it for what thou losest is a loss to thee as it were from one of thine own members for tell me, if any one gave thee gold dust, wouldst thou not with all precaution keep it fast, being on thy guard losing against losing any of it and suffering loss? How much more cautiously then wilt thou observe that not a crumb falls from thee of what is more precious than gold and precious stones? Okay, well, question. How, how are the laity receiving Holy Communion here? In their palm. In their palm. Um, and um, it's interesting, actually, the gesture. You know, um, some some people at Holy Trinity, I notice, when they come for a priest's blessing, they go like this. Um, I don't really know where that comes from, but they're they're definitely. I mean, being the priest, I can tell you, deacons. I see the slight startle that. Uh, um, that that is the case. There are some people that, that come like this. But typically, as we teach people, they're supposed to come when they come for a blessing, right hand over left. Um, and it's interesting, it's the same gesture there. Uh, and that's also the way that as a priest, for instance, when I come to communion and there's a bishop present, well, I don't dare to take uh, Holy Communion for myself but it has to be given to me. Um, and so I do that same gesture that, that, um, you know, making the, uh, what does he say? Making my right hand, a, uh, my left hand, a throne for my right. right. And this is, this is what the deacons do as well. When they, when they receive and the, the priest, you know, uh, takes the, the Holy body. Um, can you think of a reason uh, I mean, just a practical reason why the church ends up after around a millennium going with the spoon. Well, it seems to me that that you either have you either have communion in the hand, receiving in the hand, and then taking the chalice, or you have some vessel with which you can can distribute both both uh, species together and that's the spoon yeah I, I would say one of your big issues um and i'm sure that you know uh now there are other phases of this too i mean like i remember visiting a coptic church and the way that the the laity were communed was the priest would would place it in the mouth directly like with his uh -huh. finger and then they would they would drink from the common cup oh. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there are potentially other variants, but one of the things that the spoon eliminates is this danger, you know, that, 
that Cyril is saying, you know, look, it's like you have gold dust in your hands. You can't be, you know, you can't be casual about this, right? Um, and that is when you when when you go to the spoon, then there's not that danger on a practical level. Um, you know, uh, I think about, you know, John Chrysostom. Um, I remember encountering a sermon that he preached once where he was talking about like the, the kind of violence of the mob as they sort of press one another together to come get Holy Communion. Not that they're violent, they're not angry, right? But just like they're cajoling one another and jostling one another, and he's not happy about it. Yeah, um, and that's, that's another thing you don't want someone taking away. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll you tell know, you. You don't want taking away the, 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 the bread uh, yes. and wine to be, to be used in another, in another way. context. I know when I was in Mount Carmel, um, you know, there was this man who had been Roman Catholic, and I just, and well, he'd been Roman Catholic, he'd been Orthodox, he'd been Lutheran, he'd been Episcopal, he's been everything, right? Like, you, but briefly, right? Mm. Um, oh. Well, and, and he was excommunicated, like, even the liberal Protestants, like, would not commune him, actually. Um, because you know, he would go in and like into their churches and like, you know, first he would like take communion from the, the, the female minister. And then he'd like start telling her, you know, you're wrong. You're a heretic. You know, you're, you're, you're going to hell. Oh, like, you know, it's like, oh, I mean, yeah. they all, um, but he had, he had been Orthodox briefly, but anyway, um, the reason I bring him up, um, was, uh, he stole a Catholic host and he had it in a monstrance in his house. Mm -hmm. yep. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. And well, so then he ended up going to a nursing home and he brought his monstrance and he like set it up and he's like leading this worship for these people. Well, now he revealed this to me and I totally, I was on the phone like instantly with the Catholic priests in the area. I'm like, you got to know what this guy is doing. And they called the nursing homes and needless to say, it stopped pretty quickly after that. But he, I mean, he showed up, he showed up, he was posing as a monastic. Uh, um, but again, there, you're, you know, Mary, you're absolutely right. Like, there's some danger, right? Like, the Catholics have, have reinstituted d distribution on the hands, but people can do, you know, take it and do other things with it. That's, that's the big, that's the biggest fear among the other laity is that, that someone will palm those and, and take it out and abuse it blaspheme it yeah yeah um so i think um you know there's that now um for the other part that is really very strange to us as moderns um and i don't know what to make of it uh you know i'm like trying to search for a non-literal interpretation of this and there is a, a metaphorical use of this word that he's translating touch here about five lines down, six lines down. Um, but I'm not sure that's what he means, especially when we read the next section. Like, is he really talking about like touching your eyes with the body? I mean, I don't know. Father's like, well, when we read the next section, you'll have to, give me your your thoughts on this i mean this is really um certainly this strikes me as the kind of thing that is short-lived in christian practice and probably kind of idiosyncratic to cyril's time and and community but i don't know and and again it's 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 going to get slightly stranger in the next section um so who'd like to read 22 for us i can do that uh then after having partaken of the body of Christ, approach also to the cup of his blood, not stretching forth thine hands, but bending and saying in the way of worship and reverence, Amen, be thou hallowed by partaking also of the blood of Christ. And while the moisture is still upon thy lips, touching it with thine hands, hallow both thine eyes and brow and the other senses. Then wait for the prayer and give thanks unto God, who hath accounted thee worthy of so great mysteries. Oh, thank you. Um, 
So uh, I interpret the first part, the not stretching forth thy hands, uh, as meaning essentially, um, I I'm assuming that, that he's saying that the laity are not to touch the chalice with their hands. Um, at least that's the way I'm reading that, that they, that they kind of, um, you know, receive without actually touching it. Um, so be thou hallowed, be thou made holy. Uh, by partaking of the blood of Christ. Now, this last part, I mean, this is really weird. I mean, I'm just, it's my take on it. It's really weird. Um, so, are they, like, they receive, and then they, like, wipe their lip, and then touch their hands with it and their eyes and their brow and their senses. I mean, that's like a, almost a reenactment of chrismation, right? In a yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but that, I mean, to me, as a priest in the 21st century, like if anyone did something like that, you know, whether he was a priest or a bishop or whatever, I would think, my goodness, this is kind of a blasphemous act. I mean, and obviously Cyril does not mean it that way at all, mm -hmm. whatever he's suggesting. Um, but again, I think this is probably something that's kind of idiosyncratic and kind of um, short-lived in church history. But it's very interesting because, again, like, like, I don't know, Father's Deacon, like, if someone were to do something like that, wouldn't that be your sense that this is something kind of like, wow, this is kind of blasphemous i don't know i mean it's i would probably just say oh that's being dangerous i mean it's just not, da not danger like um to the soul but just like you know you're you, a lot could go wrong <laughs> you know in that, in that case you don't want to do anything that might spill or um you know, you know be in a situation where you're doing something that could potentially be distracting or you know um, make more problems yeah. than it's worth <laughs> that's for but sure you know, you know what else it's said i mean it, what, what he says i mean oh go, go ahead mary no that's all right uh, well i was just going to say it, it says something about the timing of things i mean one of the things that i that that always throws me is when receiving communion I'm I'm always aware that I I I've, I've got to be right that the one before me is leaving and I've got to get right up there and there's one behind me and so there's a there's a kind of a push that goes mm. into it and I and I always feel I mean I always I don't know I want that few extra seconds to to be in the moment fully and to to be aware of it fully and to to live it and I always feel like somehow I'm zooming past that very moment where I should be right, right. I should not be zooming past. And so right. what this says to me is that there was some sense in the in the with the ancients here that you take your time. Yeah. In the reception, that takes time to to make the sign of the cross on your forehead, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. Right. So, you know, it, it, that takes a certain amount of time. And so it's not a rushed uh, right. ritual. Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting. Um, I, I think uh, to say pastorally there, um, you know, that's uh, that's a passion. I mean, to, to rising there, you know, um, that's earthly cares. You know, if you're if you're about to receive, you know, don't worry about the length of time or any of that kind of thing. I mean, you know, obviously, in in a grand scheme, uh, part of the reason that we use three chalices is, is that you know mm -hmm. we are trying to, you know, kind of expedite the process, if you will. Um, but I mean, that's not really. I don't know. That's not something to be focused on at that point. I mean, not to, um, but, but just thank God, you know, you don't have to deal with Chrysostom's parishioners who are literally pushing <laughs> you in the back. <laughs> I think that was from his time in Antioch, if I remember correctly. 
Well, I, I will say just in, uh, in the parish practice here, there are, I won't say a lot of people, there are people who stop until, you know, the servant of God, so-and-so receives the Bible. Yes. They will stop and, and wait till that whole prayer is over and will say amen, which I always appreciate because it's sort of yeah. like, and they're not walking away as, as, as that, yeah. you know, short prayer is being said in front of them. Yes. Right. Right. Now that's yeah. yeah I, I do the same thing. I wait. I, 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 I used to run and run through it, and then I thought this is dumb. I mean, I'm yes. I, yeah. Yeah, and there there is that level of um. I mean. You know, we're not trying to be robotic, and like efficiency is not our like that's not our goal. Main aim. Our, no. Our, no. So, I mean, it's like. It's like a consideration out there, but it's not, I mean, thank God, you know, one of the things that the church has been resistant to is like the whole idea of like a 30 minute mass, right? Uh -huh. uh, I mean, the liturgy is just, uh, you know, it participates in, in, in eternity, but it also takes time. And when we come to church to pray, we should expect to take time. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's nothing that, that you all do that, that caused that in me initially, but it was just watching others and, and not wanting to hold everybody up and not, uh, but it took me a while to be able to just stand there and wait until the prayer was done and, and say the amen and then move off. That's one of the, the nicest things to me uh, about our communion practice is that nobody communes anonymously, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, mm -hmm. there's that, like, okay, servant of God, whoever you are, you know, mm -hmm. whatever your name happens to be, and, you, and it has to be a name, you know. Um, yep. That's, well, I mean, this is, this is the, the one that we follow in order to become human beings, to become persons. Uh, and so there's that level of... Um, this is something also intensely personal. Um, you know, you're, you're one of God's children. That's why you, you bear a name. It's funny. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I love that image in the scriptures that we don't really know what our final name is, that only, you know, ultimately only God knows what, uh, what the ultimate name. But even these names we bear now in this life, they'll be part of our name. Mm -hmm. That's, surely. I mean, it's just like, you know, Simon becomes Peter, but also stays Simon. You know, I be mm -hmm. Ignatius, but I also stay Edward. <laughs> uh, ah, now I know. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! And this is on. This is on. Oh darn. Too. So uh, everybody knows now. Yes. You know. You know well, what? What you guys should advertise this as. Uh, as as you know, uh, somewhere in. Don't tell him it's at the end. Somewhere in this, uh, you know, he he reveals his name. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. Okay, so um, so Father, so, just one thing you know, he had uh, mentioned about verses or uh, sections 21 and 22, and uh, the one verse in there in 21 it says, Then after thou hast with carefulness hallowed thine eyes by the touch of the holy body, partake thereof. And you know, reading them together, I kind of look at this because my. And as a clergy, we see that we, you know, we receive the the body from the from the priest from the bishop in your hand. So mm -hmm. you're actually looking at it. You're looking yeah. at the body in your hand. Mm -hmm. And and it's when I read that now, I read that to say that by thine eyes, by the touch of the holy body, the touch of my hands, but my eyes are hollow because I can actually see the body of Christ. That's the way I want to read it, Father. <laughs> that's the. That's, I was so. Uh, I mean, and, and and maybe that's maybe that's true, um, you know, because again, that that word touch can be metaphorical. It can mean something like apprehension, you know, by the by the apprehension of. But, eh, well, I don't know. Um, hopefully. Saint Cyril will not uh, condemn me if I've misinterpreted him badly here. Um, but okay, any other comments on on those or uh, okay, twenty three. This one's pretty easy. Who wants this one? 
I'll take it. Oh. Hold fast these traditions unspotted and keep yourselves free from an offense. Sever not yourselves from the, from the communion. Deprive not yourselves by the pollution of sins of these holy and spiritual mysteries. And the God of peace sanctify you wholly and may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and the honor and the might with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, there you have it. Catechesis is over. Darn. Uh, <laughs> no probably delve back into his uh, to his other lectures that might be uh, that might be very profitable and valuable um, so just a couple of questions uh, for those participating um, you know as we contemplate doing adult ed in the fall um, what are your thoughts on using this medium like is this is this something um, I guess like If it were up to you, would you prefer to be in person? Would you prefer to be virtual in this way? Would you prefer, you know, to have the option of doing either, you know, like, like sort of like a group meeting somewhere at Holy Trinity um, and then like others uh, on a Zoom call? Uh, thought, thoughts on that at all? I, I like the mixed, mixed media. I like the option of being there in person and also not being there in person on the times when, it, when and that's perfectly selfish because i am at my good days and bad days mm -hmm. and so for me the ideal thing would be to have the option of coming and being with all of you which i love and whom i love and uh, or if i can't then at least not missing you because i can come to you this way mm -hmm. so i like i vote for both is that possible, Deacon Alex? Okay. I, I've pretty much learned that when it comes to technology, about anything is possible with Deacon Alex. So um, he's he's got it. What, what are your thoughts, uh, Deacon Mark? Do you, do you like the uh, um, online format? I mean, I guess it does have some advantages doing it this way. I, I was saying to Mary earlier, you know, like you can kind of get up and go get yourself a snack or something now. You don't have to drive home. Um, no, I would think in, in, because of where we are today, I would think both of them would be advantageous. You know, people yeah. would be comfortable being there. People would be comfortable watching. Well, you know what? Glory to God, then maybe this will uh, inspire us to um, to try some kind of hybrid uh you know in person and streaming uh uh concept and that you know so well we look at this time that we've dealt with with the covid thing and think about all the ways it's been bothersome but maybe maybe some good will come out of it as well mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts uh karen you have any any thoughts no, I, th I think the next thing sounds good too uh and yeah. since I have transportation issues, it's good if I can Zoom. Yeah, 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 that's good. Um, so uh, then uh, the only other thing, um, I guess, uh, does anybody have any thoughts on um, subjects of study? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of eager on some level, I, I want to be teaching Bible, you know, like that's that's gotta happen. Um, but if like the by the by well either parts of the bible people might be interested in or things that that are outside of the bible that you might just throw up and say well what if we looked at this any any thoughts on uh, on that kind of thing i i like taking a, a book and going through at least part or you know it'd be difficult with some of the books to go through the whole book in a, in a class, but to, to, do, to do portions or, or significant pieces. Of, Are you talking about a scriptural book? Of a book, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I've had other people kind of give, it's actually sometimes random other people give input on things that they'd, they'd like to see as far as some um, scripture being taught. Do you have a particular part of the scripture that, that jumps into your mind and says, you know, I'd like to study that? Um, Oh God. <laughs> yeah, a bunch is, but you know, I've always been particularly, uh, I've always been personally attached to Hebrews. I would love to do a study on, on Hebrews. Mm. Um, That'd be very worthwhile. You um, know, the minor, the might just going through the minor prophets. I, I mean, I, I led a, a, a one on, on, um, Nehemiah and it was, it was amazing. I, I learned so much and I, that I didn't know just to be able to have, you know, to sort of facilitate a, a group looking at the, that, that book and and um, I, I found it to be a wonderful experience and I thought I, I really hadn't paid a lot of attention to the minor prophets until then and then I started reading them and I thought oh wow you know so you know, I wasn't doing it's that. funny it's funny I, I've gotten a number of answers again like sometimes kind of unsolicited to this question and nobody said the gospels yet <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> we take for granted that that gets read in church or what <laughs> Well, I would say, I mean, I have a preference for the epistles, and it makes me feel guilty sometimes that I really like the epistles better than the Gospels. Mm. But um, but I'd be interested really in anything, since I haven't done a Bible study from an Orthodox perspective, any of it's okay with me. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. I, I, I've gotten a lot of answers, you know, relative to, to epistles, so I'll have to take that into consideration. Um, I mean, no, I, I, I wouldn't mind the, I, I love the book. I love Luke. I would love to do, I would love to do the synoptic gospels and do a little bit of history. That would hmm. be fun. Hmm. Well, to do, to do three gospels like that, I mean, that's, that's a very long, uh, but I, I, I would be very okay with, you know, kind of a working through, um, you know, kind of one to two chapters at a time method, but uh, you know, to do to do the first three gospels together, boy, that's uh Well no to, not to look not to look at each one of them individually, but just to, to sort of look at them in a comparative way and in a historical oh. way. That that's what I was thinking. Rather than lock stepping through all three. Ooh. Oh boy, that's uh yeah, that's a tall order. I mean that's Yeah uh, it is. I know you'd have to is. you'd have to you know I'd have to do a lot of research for that, which yeah, yeah, you would. It I'm would okay with you know, if God if God will grant me the time, but yeah. um, okay, certainly not this coming year. We'll give you <laughs> any any any, uh, any um, other kind of final thoughts for the good of the order. Um, I had one other thing, but I, it doesn't matter. I can't I can't raise it at the moment. So. Okay. Yeah. Well. Um, then uh, God bless you all, and uh, thank you for for you participating this night. Prayer, Father. Yes. It is truly me to bless you, O Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the Mother of our God more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without defilement you gave birth through God the word, true Theotokos, we magnify you. Glory to Jesus Christ. Lord, forever. Lord, forever. Lord, forever. I know there's a different one of those for the uh, Annunciation, uh, uh, the Ascension season here, but I don't remember what it is. <laughs> well, another Theotokian. Thank you, everyone. Much love in Christ. Mary, we'll see you tomorrow. Yes, I'll be there, eleven o'clock. Awesome. All right. God okay. bless you all. Good night, Mary. Good night, Father. Good night. Okay.